All right. Hello, everyone. Um, bonjour. Good morning. Really nice to see everyone uh, over here. I believe this is uh, the first breakout right now after the keynote, right? So I'm hoping that all of you are excited for the rest of the conference as well. All right. Uh, first of all, thanks for, thanks for joining in. Uh, before we get started with the session, um, a quick, quick introduction about me. Um, I'm Karan, and uh, I lead uh, international developer relations at uh, GitHub, and I lead a team of DevRel professionals helping support ecosystems in India, Latin America, and some of the uh, other parts of the world as well. So I'm very much still a developer by heart and passionate about uh, DevOps, infrastructure, AI, and uh, a whole lot of other things. And, uh, you know, this, this passion of mine has led me to um, actually build and maintain a couple of services at uh, GitHub as well, which, which is being used by a lot of uh, internal GitHub uh, employees as well. Now, I know, you know, uh, we'll be covering quite a few things over here, but the first thing uh, that I really want to talk about in a very, very short way is, well, what is GitHub? I'm sure you know many of you might not need a really lengthy explanation because most probably you use it either as a part of your work or for your personal uh, you know projects and other things, etc. But for those of you who aren't uh, familiar um, as to what is GitHub or where GitHub is right now and what GitHub is really doing, then a really quick introduction um, is summed up in in this graphic over here, which is that GitHub right now is uh, you know, a complete AI-powered developer platform used by more than 100 million developers to collaboratively build, test, deploy software, and really manage the entire software development workflow in hundreds of millions of repositories and uh, a whole suite of products that can help you across your software uh, lifecycle as well. Now, of course, you know, that's, that's the scale of uh, GitHub. And and what it is meant for you know, all of the users as well. Now, um, how many of you here uh, are, are really working on the ops side of uh, Kubernetes or you know, really on the administration side? How many of you on that end? Okay, quite a few. Uh, how many of you are just interested in knowing, all right, what does happen behind the scenes at GitHub? Quite a few, all right? I'm assuming the rest of the them uh, are probably mixed on multiple things. Now, of course, uh, you know, this is, of course, the scale of GitHub, and some of you might be interested in knowing what's the scale at which GitHub runs behind the scenes and, uh, you know, the scale of GitHub as a platform uh, itself. So let me give you, you know, a, a very small uh, overview uh, on what does this scale look like, uh, you know, behind the scenes at, at GitHub. Um, and I'm, I'm going to share a little bit around what this looks like, especially from our CI-CD side of things, all right? Now, if you were to just talk about GitHub as, you know, a platform and also talk about the code base, um, you can find a lot more about uh, what what GitHub's uh, architecture and some of the other things looks like on the GitHub blog itself. But essentially, there is you know, a, a monolith, and uh, GitHub's engineers, um, just for the monolith, keeping aside a whole lot of uh, the microservices, uh, perform more than 20 plus deployments a day. Now, you might be wondering, well, thousands of engineers, 20 plus deployments a day. Uh, again, we explain a lot more about this on one of our blog as well, because these 20 plus deployments are for the main GitHub monolith, and each deployment includes multiple PRs which are deployed and merged using uh, GitHub merge queues, again. And what this means is that some of these deployments and the pipelines um, run almost 15,000 CI jobs in an hour. And I'm being very, very conservative over here because like how I mentioned, this is mainly for the monolith and excludes a whole lot of other microservices uh, that are there. And these CI jobs uh, consume uh, almost a staggering of 125,000 build minutes just in an hour for all of these CI jobs. And 
which is almost 150,000 cores of compute. So now you can imagine, well, you probably know what is the scale of GitHub as a platform. And just as one of the metrics on the CI CD side, this is the scale of GitHub, uh, you know, on, on the development, uh, development side. Now, uh, of course, this is, this is massive. And uh, there are a whole lot of microservices and GitHub, uh, you know, is a huge code base as well with multiple different products, features, and thousands of engineers uh, working together. So this really, this scale really warrants, the, you know, to make GitHub what it is today. Uh, which brings me to, you know, to one of the things as to how is, how is some of this possible? What does this look like? for one of you know a typical engineers or what does it look like on the platform side of things for us uh, within github now to speak about that for some of the github engineers to really efficiently code build and you know ship a whole lot of software uh, you know we provide our engineers with what we call as a paved path now there might be similar terminologies that you could have heard from other organizations uh, as well. But, uh, you know, at GitHub, we call it as the paved part, which is, again, you know, a lot of comprehensive suite of uh, automated tools, applications, uh, you know, processes, runtime platforms, etc., cetera, which, which really help with the deployment, hosting, and a whole lot of other things that, uh, that GitHub engineers can use to run microservices, uh, you know, both for the github.com platform itself and also for many of the internal tools. Um, so let me give you a little bit overview on what this paved path really looks like. Now, uh, GitHub's main pa uh, paved path covers everything that's needed for running software, be it, uh, you know, creating, deploying, scaling, debugging applications and microservices. Um, and also, it is more of an ecosystem of tools, uh, which, you know, which includes, of course, Kubernetes, Docker, load balancers, and a lot of uh, custom apps as well, so that a more cohesive experience can be provided for the engineers. Now, uh, don't get mistaken when I when I say that you know it's a paved path. It's not just infrastructure or it's not just Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes is of course our base layer, and uh, the paved path is really a mix of some of the conventions, some of the tools, and some of uh, you know the config configuration settings and processes built on top of that. Now. Uh, speaking about Kubernetes itself, uh, that's of course our base layer and it runs in a multi-cluster and a multi-region uh, topology. A little bit more about that later. Now, why this? Why a paved path? How does it, how does it really uh, you know, help us? A apart from the benefits of uh, using Kubernetes itself. Now, with our paved path based on Kubernetes, including Kubernetes and some of the other runtime apps, what we're able to do is that we are able to plan a lot of this capacity centrally across, uh, of course, all of these services that are there since a lot of the workloads, smaller, uh, larger workloads exist on the same machines, right? So the capacity planning has moved, uh, you know, centrally for us. And of course, because of the central capacity planning, we are able to scale rapidly as well as and when needed, as and when there is you know, more uh, demand that's needed. And also we are able to consistently provide insights into app and deployment uh, performance to the service owners, um, you know, almost at the level of uh, what is a specific pod doing, what's a specific container doing, et cetera, more easily. And of course, because, because you know, uh, Kubernetes is our base layer, it also becomes easy to manage all of the configuration and the deployments in a central control plane without having to really jump across uh, various different places. Now, the kind of services that we typically run using, uh, you know, the paved path include things like uh, small web applications, computation pipelines, batch processors, and, you know, monitoring systems, etc. So various of these uh, services and kinds of services, we run it, uh, you know, using our paved path. Now, 
of course you know most of uh, you know most of the really awesome stuff there's there's always a hero or there's always you know a rock star uh, who really helps make all of these things happen right now at this point i actually want to introduce one of our rock stars at uh, github so he's he's a very very formidable uh, formidable force at github and uh, is something that when you say the name of that rock star right uh, it's something that almost every github employee uh, will know about and you know because very very fun as well um which is hubot all right now so hubot is uh, you know an open source uh, framework to write chatbots and a really standardized way to share uh, scripts between you know everyone's uh, robots etc for auto automating multiple things so we at github wrote the first version of uh, hubot uh, and of course made it open source to automate some of our company chat room and uh, you know hubot you know knew and knows to do a lot of things like uh, you know deployments and uh, and also some of the tests and everything else but he was a very very you know he led a very private and a very introverted and a messy life so we just uh, you know rewrote him and even today we use hubot for uh, automating a lot of tasks in our development processes be it like kicking off ci builds or you know running entire deployments uh, etc very very easily through chat ops uh, commands as well you know as an example uh, you know we use hubot uh, to deploy say a specific branch from a specific repository into a certain environment all right so we use we use a methodology called as branch deployments rather than you know deploying main um again you can find a little bit more about why we do that and what's the uh, rationale on the github blog but an example of using something like hubot to run a deployment of a branch um you know with something like this where we just go into uh, you know a specific uh, chat ops room and then just say hubot deploy whatever is the repo slash branch to you know an environment uh, and then you know th that's that's where things kicks off uh, so i'm i'm not going to dive a lot deeper into this pave path but i wanted uh, you know to use that to set a context of uh, how all of this really helps uh, you can read more about that in one of the blogs i co-authored on the github blog uh, you can just go to gh.io/pavepath and uh, you know read a lot more in detail about how this all works what does you know uh, containerization look like what does a deployment pipeline look like etc now uh, i gave you some examples right that we use it for web apps we use it for you know computation pipelines batch processors etc but we also use it to run a very very key component of one of our products and i'm i'm sure you know when i say that you will be able to guess what it is uh, which is of course a github copilot now github copilot for those of you who might uh, not be aware is our ai coding assistance uh, tool which is widely adopted by developers uh, worldwide and has you know multiple features that can help developers and uh, organizations be a lot more productive and uh, one of them one of those features of github copilot is uh, a chat based interface that offers uh, an ai based coding assistance so uh, as an as a an ex as an example uh you know this is this is what it looks like where you'll be able to really give a prompt and uh, you know generate uh generate code in multiple different scenarios so you can go to gh.io/copilot to know a lot more about it but one of the key components uh that we run on our pave path for copilot um is for using you know the client side extensions now the client side extensions of copilot communicate with a server side uh, you know api to deliver all of those amazing ai based uh, suggestions that developers use while uh, you know while kind of coding now uh, you know we run this again api using our pave path and as you can guess this api uh, you know gets massive amount of requests uh and needs to handle a lot of load because millions of developers are using github copilot da uh, daily you know in and out for their everyday life right and uh, you know this is this is of course one of the examples that uh you know gives you an idea of the kind of scale and load that our pave path has to support and ultimately our underlying uh, kubernetes infrastructure 
Um, and this is just one of it, and along with a lot of the services, right, makes it very, very necessary that the Kubernetes infrastructure has, you know, and the pave path has a high degree, very high degree of uh, reliability and availability um, because of the API usage and all of these services as well. Now, what it means and what it comes down to is that, of course, delivering a lot of this reliability and availability is possible when we are able to operate our Kubernetes clusters a lot more efficiently, right? Um, so if you think about it, as a end user, someone who is using Copilot or some of the other uh, services would expect that reliability and availability, which in turn would be expected off the paved path, which in turn would be expected off our Kubernetes infrastructure, um, you know, which in turn means that being able to operate a large, you know, uh, multi-region, multi-cluster, topological cluster will be, you know, much more important. Now, of course, you might have heard of, you know, a lot of different ways to do this and administer this right from, uh, you know, kind of automating on top of the native API constructs or third-party tools, etc. Uh, you know, we, we kind of, uh, you know, chose to do that a little bit differently, mainly because of the scale at which we need to help support um, our payoff path, and also partly because of some of our engineering and uh, security practices, uh, because of which we chose to implement a custom solution to really operate our uh, Kubernetes clusters a lot more efficiently. And one of the things at GitHub is that we like to we like to run as much as possible through code and uh, codify a lot of our tasks, be it be it something as simple as probably. Uh, you know, managing identity and access for for a lot of the employees or something which is a lot more specialized like infrastructure as code. We like to kind of codify some of that as much as possible. And even for managing our own Kubernetes uh, infrastructure, we decided to adopt a very similar um, approach of, of, you know, managing it through code. And to be honest, we took some inf inspiration from how Kubernetes um, orchestration works as well. So let me let me give you an idea of what this really looks like for us, uh, you know, in terms of operating some of these things. Now, what we have done is we have created an internal platform versioning spec that really helps us create our own configurations, bundle some of the common components into a well-known config, and uh, you know create a very deployable artifact. Now, this, this helps us make sure that, you know, a set of common components work together as a platform at the Kubernetes uh, layer, and also it helps us treat our infrastructure platform at a, uh, almost like a state machine, but at a higher abstraction level than what uh, some of the other tools might offer. And also to ensure flexibility in overriding on a per cluster configuration level whenever, uh, whenever it's needed. Now, you know, as an example, what this spec looks like is something like this. So you would see that it's very, very, you know, similar to say like a CRD, uh, but, but not exactly. We wanted to make it that way and can see that it also encompasses, you know, things like your uh, Kubernetes versions, etcd versions, network plugins, um, you know, secrets and a whole lot of things as well that are kind of together versioned in a single platform uh, spec. Now, these specs are maintained in a, uh, you know, a separate re repository internally where we kind of organize it by the cluster because we operate in a multi-cluster topology and also group together by a specific platform version. Uh, what this happens is that these configurations which are there as spec um, are then hydrated expanded into a full suite of uh, configuration along with the necessary files, necessary, you know, system D units and uh, everything else that are required to run an entire KH cluster. And again, stored in an artifact repository that's ready to be deployed. I'll show you, you know, how, uh, how this happens, all right? How does the artifact really makes its way into a cluster when you're looking at a platform spec like this? Now let's look at a scenario. Um, say whenever a new configuration, you know, has to be deployed to the cluster, say to perform an upgrade with, uh, with etcd or anything else that needed. Um, there is first an intervention uh, by one of the operators 
the Kubernetes operator, whoever is an admin. So they go into this repository where all of the platform version specs are there and uh, they make a modification to that platform spec either through a version bump or whatever else that needs to be done or override for a per cluster configuration. Um, and then they create a pull request, of course, with all of those changes because all of these platform version specs live within a uh, repository. Um, and what happens is that when this pull request is created, we again automatically kick off a CI which creates a bundled artifact with all of the changes, all right? So like how I mentioned, there is the platform version spec which defines, but the CI really, uh, you know, when, when, the, when the CI gets kicked off, it does all of the hydration, expansion, and also creating the uh, deployable uh, artifact into a single bundle that will be stored in the artifact repository. So when, uh, when this has to be deployed, when this pull request has to be uh, deployed, what happens is that the bundle that was created, which is completely expanded and hydrated along with any other configuration within the uh, you know, repository, gets deployed to every node within the, uh, you know, within our underlying Kubernetes uh, infrastructure, all right? Now, this is of course at a, at a CI level or a CD level, I would say, which includes creating the bundled config and also the deployment into every node. But what does this, what does this node level, you know, rollout process look like? Yeah, because we came all the way from looking at, well, you know, this is the paved path which really helps us um, you know, be successful with a whole lot of our services and also how it's really important for our operating. And then we saw that, all right, this is how we do with the platform version spec. But what really happens at a node level? What is this, you know, life cycle look like for the nodes and some of the orchestration pieces? So let's, let's take a quick look at uh, that. Um, before that, let's see what are the components of this design that we have as a part of, uh, you know, our uh, KH infrastructure at a node level. Uh, of course, this is a simplified version, but here's a control plane node. You can see, you know, the usual uh, standard components, like you know, that you can see, like uh, your container runtime, kubelet, etcd, your uh, workload pod, etc. And uh, you know, again a more simplified version of a worker node where you have your kubelet, your container runtime and workload pods as well, right? So uh, this, is, this is of course a standard control plane and a worker node. And apart from some of this, we also deploy a few other components on our nodes as a part of the provisioning uh, you know, process itself. Now, on all of the nodes, irrespective of whether it's a control plane node or a worker node, we deploy a custom node agent, all right, as a part of the provisioning process itself. What is this node agent? Why is it important? I'll come to it. And specifically on the control plane nodes, we also deploy a coordinator agent, okay? Um, so there is node agent on every node and also a specific coordinator agent on the control plane. And apart from all of this, we also have, you know, an event bus for all of the communications, you know, between node agent, coordinator agent, uh, et cetera, all right? Like how I mentioned, it's a little bit of, uh, it's a little bit of, uh, you know, what works for us, for our scale and for our practices, and also some inspiration from Kubernetes orchestration. Um, now, you know, previous slides you might have again recollected, but just to reemphasize that is, uh, whenever there is a PR uh, change to the platform cluster version, right? Uh, the bundled configuration, uh, what would have been created as a part of CI and deployed through the pipelines, uh, you know, would, would exist on the file system of all of the nodes. Now, one of the things, of course, which will happen is that at that point, when the deploy happens, the CD pipeline would have deployed all of the bundled configuration and then, you know, extracted it on all of the nodes, et cetera. But, it, but it's still an artifact. It doesn't really do anything, right? Um, they need to be applied for the desired changes to come into effect. And that's, that's really where the coordinator uh, comes, into, comes into picture. Now, again, the coordinator is, is a daemon agent that runs on each of the control plane uh, node. 
and it's really responsible for orchestrating all of the cluster-wide configurations that need to be done. Now, how does this do this? I'll share a few examples. They're not in any specific uh, you know, order, but it does so by, say, writing the desired cluster state, whatever is needed, into a config map on the cluster. So it's available uh, you know, to be referenced to the Kubernetes API as well. And it again writes whatever is the node platform version, um, you know, state to the node resources as well. Uh, so, so that again, you know, there could be a platform version that's separate for nodes, separate for control uh, plane nodes, etc. cetera. Um, and then again, it also does some of these things like, uh, you know, removing, uncordoning the nodes and, you know, putting them into a maintenance mode. Uh, not necessarily just uncordon, the maintenance could mean other things as well. Um, and also ensures that, of course, only a safe budget of cluster resources are uh, unavailable at any time. Um, and also, you know, it publishes events to the event bus to trigger a node to update. That's the means of uh, communication. And also it consumes some of these success and failure events that gets generated by the node agent. All right. Now, again, you might be thinking that, well, hey, this is, isn't this something that we can probably do using ABC tool or automate on top of, uh, you know, on top of uh, the, the Kubernetes API itself? But I'll, I'll, I'll come to that uh, also a bit. So to perform all of these operations, there are a few communications that needs to take place that the coordinator really need to communicate uh, with. First is, of course, it needs to communicate with the Kubernetes API itself, right? For example, before putting a node into whatever is a custom maintenance mode, it would have it needs to do, you know, a simple uncordon, uh, drain, and all of those things, and any other tainting that may, that might be needed, etc. So, works extensively with the Kubernetes API. Um, also, communicates with a lock service because the coordinator is a daemon agent running on every control plane node, uh, you know. It, of course, wouldn't be uh, feasible to run this without a lock service so that there is only one process of uh, the coordinator that's helping orchestrate. And also, of course, communicates with the event bus itself, um, you know, to communicate with the node agents and the rest of the uh, systems, etc. So what does this do, all right, at the end of the day? What does the coordinator do? It really looks at the cluster-wide configurations, all right? It doesn't look at any of the node-specific configurations. Uh, so what it does is that, you know, it keeps attempting to iterate until all of the nodes are running the desired platform version. Remember that it publishes the node platform version to all of the node resources. Um, and then, you know, it keeps iterating until this happens. Um, or, you know, enough nodes become unavailable, uh, uh, and it exceeds the cluster budget, in which case, you know, an operator interference might be needed uh, to figure out what's, what's really happening here, all right? Now, like I mentioned, all of this is something which happens for the cluster-wide configuration, but something needs to apply, right? Uh, something needs to actually perform all of these platform version updates on the node, and that's where the node agent comes in um, in, in our design. Now, again, the node agent is also, uh, you know, a daemon that runs on all of the nodes, workers, as well as control planes. Now, the platform version spec could be a little different depending on whether it's, you know, a worker node or a control plane node, et cetera. But what it is, again, at the end of the day, responsible for is ensuring that whatever is the desired platform version spec converges with whatever is the current platform version spec on uh, that specific uh, that specific node, all right? And again, if you recollect, I mentioned that as a part of our uh, CD pipeline, we would have deployed all of the bundled config um, as well to all of the nodes. So the node agent is what, uh, you know, is responsible to make sure that all of that bundled config is, is actually running, right? Because that's not what the coordinator would do. That's what, uh, you know, the node would do. So what would it do? It does something like, for example, hydrating any node-specific templates. Now, some of it would have already been hydrated and expanded in CI, but there might be some node-specific templates which it will, you know, rehydrate again if it's, it's not pre-hydrated in CI. 
Um, and it does like, of course, clearing out all of the container runtime, kubelet data directories, et cetera, to move it into the desired version, uh, moves any of the files into place, like any newer binaries um, or you know, any other systemd units, does the reloading and reconfiguring at a node level, and also you know, runs any of the necessary system configurations through a config management tool, um, and also, you know, does things like restarting services, uh, etc. Whatever is there. Um, so now the node agent, of course, will begin converging the node uh, to the desired platform version after after consuming an, uh, an event that is published by the coordinator on the uh, event bus. So if it successfully converges, it will again publish an update on the event bus, which the coordinator will consume. Um, or else it will publish a failure event and then the coordinator determines uh, what really needs to be done. So like, you know, like I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, the way for an operator to perform some of these operations, if you recollect the diagram, is to start off with a pull request with changes to the platform version, uh, you know, spec as well. So what we've done is we've gone ahead a little bit step further and actually created internal CLI tools to help make some of these changes and you know, processes very, very easier. Uh, for example, we have you know, a CLI tool that can perform some of the common tasks, uh, you know, be it version updates, patches updates, or anything else that are needed, um, run some of the CI jobs uh, locally, create a local development cluster just to uh, test out some of these platform version um, you know, changes, build some of the images, et cetera, so that it's much more easier for the operators to interact, uh, you know, with the coordinator uh, as well. And also, of course, another CLI tool where, you know, the operator can interact directly with the coordinator, whoever is the coordinator leader, um, directly instead of through a platform version spec. So, of course, useful, um, you know, in things like understanding what's the current state of the coordinator and the agent, who is the leader, and, uh, you know, all of these things, right? So, if needed, it can also be used to manually state, uh, manually change the state of the uh, cluster if needed, but that, that probably happens only in scenarios where we would have to debug something, uh, but usually happens through uh, the workflow of, uh, you know, a pull request itself that I mentioned. So just, uh, you know, quickly summarizing, right? Um, what, what we, you know, really looked at is how some of the services that all of you might be using uh, depends on the paved paths that we have created for developers and how some of that paved path, um, you know, is responsible for serving such massive requests at scale and its dependence on the resilience of the Kubernetes platform, which is, you know, in a way, again, dependent on how we are able to operate it uh, efficiently. And I think that's, that's where, uh, you know, this specific agent-based uh, lifecycle management design that, uh, you know, that I spoke about really helps us in reliably and efficiently operating our, uh, you know, Kubernetes clusters uh, at, at a very, very large scale. And it works very well when coupled with some of the other tools, uh, you know, be it, be it configuration management tools, infrastructure as code tools, CI, CD pipelines, Kubernetes, and of course, uh, you know, the GitHub platform itself. And uh, adding to that, things like the CLI tools really help further speed up some of these changes and make it very, very easier to quickly ship some of the changes to our infrastructure, uh, you know, to manage, et cetera. So at the end of the day, the bottom line that I was trying to get at is that for us, at least, the reliability and how we operate our Kubernetes infrastructure is a very, very key deciding factor for, you know, the dependability of our internal pave path and the services, you know, that it does. As an example, think about it when I gave the first example of, you know, the, the co-pilot using an internal API uh, you know, which is running on, on the paved paths to help, uh, you know, make all of this happen. So, um, I, I believe that's, you know, uh, that's a quick summary of, uh, this specific 
agent-based design that, uh, you know, that really helps us do all of these things. Um, so that's about it. Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, if this has been really useful for you, I'd suggest you please uh, share the feedback on, uh, you know, on schedule, on sked.com as well, or drop us a note on GitHub. I'm happy to take the conversation uh, forward, uh, you know, here or in the GitHub booths. We are there in uh, D3. Um, or you can reach out to me on MV Karan on Twitter, LinkedIn, etc. So thanks a lot. Thanks for your patience. Um, and I hope you have a great, uh, great rest of the uh, conference as well. So thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour.